with what you're telling uh, the new Chief Magnus? What, oh, what are you trying to inform him about, and uh, are you giving him any advice? Well, sure. We've had several conversations, and he's stepping into a different world than he did when he went to Richmond. Richmond was having a lot of problems, and there were a lot of crime issues, there were a lot of departmental issues, and, and he came in there as a change agent. Here, we have a good department, and he knows that, and he recognizes that. And the people that are here have a good reputation within the community, and we have a good reputation nationally. There's things we can do better. There's always things that we can do better. And he's very good at community connections and community policing concepts. We do a lot of that here already. Mm -hmm. So I think he, he'll have the ability of hitting the ground running here, forming those bonds and connections. And so, uh, you know, I, I think he's looking forward to it. What's been his strong point in Richmond? In Richmond, it's, it's connecting with the community okay. and, and changing the style of policing that the, the department delivered and the accountability for the department and addressing the violent crime issues they had when he first got there. Okay. Uh, and uh, what, what are you going to be doing? Uh, well, actually, I am going to be starting a consulting company with a couple of the members who sat on the president's task force with me. And we have already had the company start up in December. I'm joining in January. Uh, Commissioner Ramsey from Philadelphia, who was the co-chair of the task force, He's joining in January and we'll be working hopefully across the country. Name of this? It's going to be 21st Century Policing LLC. And exactly how will it work? What will you be helping police departments yeah, with? We've, we're not only police departments but companies that are dealing with law enforcement and services that they provide because two of the members of this are former chiefs and one is a labor attorney who represented national police officer labor organizations, we have a wide understanding of what police departments face from both the managerial side and the line side. So we can provide that type of expertise to vendors and companies that service law enforcement. And then the task force report is really gaining steam on a national level as the blueprint for how agencies should conduct their outreach to the communities, their connections, because a lot of the pillars of the report itself deal with building trust within a community and transparency and accountability. And so agencies are saying, well, we want to make these changes based on the task force recommendations. Who verifies the work that we've done that it's in line with what the task force recommended? Well, DOJ, Department of Justice, and BJA, they don't come in if it's a good agency that's just trying to get better. They come in with an agency that is broken or that's having problems or there's unrest. So they don't do that. There's really no one out there who can go in and say, yeah, this is what we talked about, but have you considered this? Or these are the recommendations that we, we put forward and maybe here's some ways you could do that. So we intend to provide that type of expertise and, and counseling as well as anything that agencies could use us for. As you prepare to leave on December 31st. Yes, sir. How's it feel? Somewhat unreal. Um, I've been here all my adult professional life, 35 years. I grew up in this agency. I have friends throughout the agency and outside of the agency, other law enforcement entities that we've worked with, community members, neighborhood groups. This has been my life. And so to say, okay, I'm ready to go on is a little unsettling, but it's also in some ways exciting because I feel like I've done as much as I could do here right now. Um, I would like to try something different, and so I'm nervous and excited at the same time. Are you going to rule out being a police chief again somewhere? I would never rule that out, but that's really not where I'm focusing my efforts right now. And, um, you know, if I step out of policing for, and it's two or three years, it's real hard to get back into it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would need to make that decision in the next year or so. But right now, I think I would like to, to try this consulting aspect. What is the greatest challenge facing the new police chief, Magnus, as he comes in? Not only Chief Magnus, but I think it's police chiefs across the country. And there was a great article in, I believe, the New York Times the other day when it talked about large city police chiefs are facing increased scrutiny and really sometimes unrealistic expectations of accountability that are making our jobs much more difficult. And a lot of that is because of technology, the, you know, the videos and the body-worn cameras. It, it's very much like a, a pro sports team. 
you know, if the team is doing bad, you can't fire the whole team, so you fire the coach. So if a department has some mishaps, quite often the chief of police pays the price. Even if they have all the right policies in place and they're trying to hold people accountable, that's just the nature of the game now that sometimes we're a political expenditure for people to throw out there if they say, well, we want to affect change. So every chief has to try and make sure that their vision goes out through the organization, they're keeping their thumb on, on the pulse of what's going on, that we're clearly investigating misconduct or allegations of misconduct, but we also have to defend our officers. Because sometimes, you know, the allegation, you're only hearing one side, and we're governed by rules and laws of what we can talk about. Mm -hmm. And so we sometimes can't give out the other side because that's a violation of either the officer's due rights or the law that governs that. And so we're kind of stuck in a position where we just have to hunker down, take the hits until we can finish our investigation and then talk about it. And public opinion can be swayed a lot during that time. So staying on top of that is a difficult thing for a chief. Speaking of public opinion, in your 35 years, the public's view of police at this time. Changed how does it dramatically. Compare? Changed dramatically. And that's kind of what I'm talking about. Um, I'm not necessarily saying that's a bad thing. Um, we have to be accountable to the communities we serve. There is no argument about that at all. But there has to be some patience from the communities we serve to make sure that we do thorough investigations, we get all the facts before we make decisions on accountability or discipline. But opening your doors and letting the people that you serve look inside your shop is never a bad thing as long as you are given the time and the wherewithal to do a complete and thorough investigation and make your decision based upon all the facts. You mentioned body cams. Where do you stand on that? We've implemented 70 body cameras within our agency. My intention, if I would have stayed here, would to get it so they're on every patrol officer out there and some of the other assignments that we have. Any indication that the new chief will do that? I really don't want to talk for him on that. I don't know what his thoughts are upon that. I don't know if they even have those cameras in Richmond or not. Okay. You were going to say something else? No, just that I, I think that whether whatever we think and like about it, I think body work cameras are going to become the expected norm. Um, people ask and clamor, especially whenever there's a high profile incident, where's the cameras? Because they kind of expect that we're all supposed to have them now. And that's the, that's the world we live in. In the technological world, they expect to see, and to be honest, most of the time if we're not recording it, someone else is. So why not have the first-hand recording of what the officer saw and what the officer perceived? What other changes have you seen uh, in your 35 years? Well, the technology is probably the biggest change. I mean, when I came on, we had just gotten pop-out radios to come out of the cars. And that was the extent. Because I remember as a young kid, if you ever saw a cop do a, a traffic stop, they had their radio blaring from the patrol car because they couldn't even take the car out. It was just a, a radio mounted in the, excuse me, not the car, the radio. It was a, it was a radio mounted in the car, mm -hmm. and they had a, a mechanism to put through a loudspeaker what the radio was saying. So we had pop-outs when I first came on. Then we got to dumb mobile data terminals that allowed us to get some, some information on there. And we've evolved that now to smartphones. We've evolved it to tablets. We've evolved it to actual computers in the cars that not only allow call information to be dispatched, but we have access to maps, to photos, to mug shots, to databases of criminal record. The advances in technology that have taken place in the 35 years that I've been doing this job are absolutely amazing. And if you were to graph it out, you would see technology and law enforcement go like this for you know, decades, and then all of a sudden, the past two or three decades, this sharp rise up. Mm -hmm. And that is really causing some of the issues that we're facing across the country, because that includes body worn cameras and recording mechanisms of that type of tech you know that type of technology terrorism seems to be changing it as does. well correct and how are the police dealing with that almost every terrorist act that has occurred in this country the first responders are the police and firefighters that are out there you know hats off to our brethren in federal law enforcement and the work that they do to try and prevent terrorism but almost every terrorism fact is going to be observed by a cop or a firefighter on the street. 
They're going to be the first ones to respond to the incidents. They're going to be the first one to maybe identify a suspected terrorist or terrorist act. And so that's part of our world now. We try and keep our officers informed with what comes to us from our federal partners. Us in our location of, of the country along the southwest border, we have extra vigilance because of the potential of entry into America from the border area. Are you very concerned about that? It's something we all have to be concerned about, I think. I think that the border is secure as much as it can be, but anyone who has spent time in southern Arizona knows that it's not a fence. It is not a strong border. There are porous areas of it that someone could come across. So the use of technology and manpower to try and staff those areas and watch those areas is extremely important. But beyond that, the vigilance of the law enforcement officers in the community such as ours play an important backup to that border protection effort. Is the Tucson Police Department ready to respond to? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have worked closely for years with federal partners on, and we even have assigned officers to task force to deal with the terrorist threat so that we have instant and immediate information as soon as it comes out from the federal authorities, we get it because we have people in the office with the federal agents as the information comes in. We can get briefings from the FBI and federal partners on what they've discovered, and then we work together locally in cooperative efforts on setting up emergency command centers. We occasionally have exercises where we work with the fire department, mm -hmm. police, sheriffs, everything so that we can coordinate responses on these tabletop and also actual physical exercises to simulate a terrorist attack or an active shooter attack, all the type of things that we hear about across the country. The Republican presidential campaign has brought up the possibility of banning Muslims, at least for a time. Your thoughts? Well, I don't want to get into the politics, but I think we need to read our history and to see what happens and make sure that our decisions are made based upon fact and not emotion. And as long as we can support our decisions um, based upon the actual facts of what we are experiencing in the country and in the region, then that is much more palatable than just making an emotional you know, claim against a certain class of people or something of that nature. Is there a law on the books that you've been called upon to enforce that you really did not want to? Geez, I can't think of one. <laughs> of course, I know what, you know, we're talking about SB 1070, and it's, it's a law I don't agree with. Um, there's several laws that I don't want to enforce and I don't agree with, but that's not my call. My job is to enforce the laws as they're passed by the community and as our system allows to stand. SB 1070, it has affected this community largely because of the, the close connection that we have along the border area with um, other communities, some north, some south of the border. It affects people in a way that can diminish their interaction and trust with law enforcement. But once it was passed by the voters and once it was appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court let a provision stand, then really that question is answered on whether or not we enforce it. We enforce it. Now we just have to make sure we're doing it as professionally as possible and in line with what the public and the community would expect from us. We've seen a number of school closures, mm -hmm. the latest in L.A. How do you handle a situation where somebody calls up and makes a threat? What do you do? Well, you have to work from an abundance of caution. Our kids are our greatest treasure. I don't think anyone would argue with that. And so if there's a threat against our kids, we have to take every precautionary step to make sure we ensure their safety and the safety of those who care for them and nurture them. So I understand completely what L.A. went through. You know, we get threats all the time, and we evaluate those threats, the credibility of those threats, and you have to at some point give an assessment and say, okay, I don't think this may be true, but I'm not willing to bet my kids' lives on the facts, so we're going to take precautions. You know, a lockdown, now L.A. was something completely different where they closed the schools, didn't even allow the kids to come. We've had lockdowns quite often, sometimes in the middle of the day, just because of the proximity of the school to an ongoing violent crime. Mm -hmm. and, and it's the same concept. 
you're protecting the kids while they're there in place. And you have to take any of these threats, whether it's an ongoing situation or just a threat of a situation, seriously, so that you're not sitting there at some tragedy afterwards saying, man, if we would have just taken those precautions, we could have prevented this. I'd rather be safe and, and um, maybe a little bit of overreaction to make sure we're safe than to worry about inconveniencing a few people and then having dead kids on my hand. In your 35 <coughs> years in law enforcement in Tucson, is there any day that sticks out as the worst for you? Well, the worst. I mean, there's so many days we've had that the trauma of the day have really hit home. But I think even though it was in the sheriff's jurisdiction, um, the January 8th shootings was very traumatic for the community as a whole because Tucson's unique. You know, I, I've, I visit a lot of back east cities and you have these very small you know, urban areas and they're, they're very homogenous. Tucson is, is, we're a region more so than a city. And so when it happens in the surrounding areas, we as a community feel that impact. So January 8th was very tough. Also, we had the College of Nurses shooting a few years before that. Mm -hmm. um, three people killed in that, and that was our jurisdiction. I was out at that scene. And to see the fear in the, in the students' eyes and the people's eyes and the hurt when you know that has occurred to a family member and you one of the things that I'll never forget is one of the cops related to they're sitting there in a room where one of the victims was laying and the victim's phone starts going off and you can't answer it but you know what it is you know it's a family member trying to call to see if their loved one is okay it's things like that that you see in policing um, that bring home the importance of the job that we do and also the tragedy that our officers face out there on a daily basis. That's why I have such extreme respect for police officers because I think that a lot of people take for granted what we do. And that's okay because we take that on and that's part of you know the, the issues of our job but it also is what fuels my respect for the people in this profession. If there is a scourge of Tucson, what would it be? What is it? Well, what, you mean something that I would say is, is that a I scourge don't like? as in something that causes crime. Oh, well, that's easy. Our crime, about 80 to 85 percent of our crime relates back to narcotics in some way, shape, or fashion. It could be because of the suppliers, whether they be cartels or customers of the cartels, bringing it across and the violence that can erupt into. It can be the end users and the property time, crime, excuse me, that they commit to support their habit. It, it could be the actions that occur when people are under the influence of narcotics, you know, the driving accidents, the fights and all these things. Mm. So many times we deal with people who are intoxicated or under the influence of narcotics and they're either the victims or suspects and perpetrators of crime. And that connection has always been universal throughout our community and partly that's, you know, long before we had the issue of cartels and what's going on in Mexico, it's just because we've always been the corridor for narcotic activity coming up into the United States. So that's always been what, what you'd call a scourge of Tucson. And is it, so it, are you saying it's worse here than in other communities because of this pipeline? I believe so because we're right in the middle of the pipeline. You know, we, we deal, we work with federal partners in narcotic enforcement, and we often track shipments to other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And we know and we get contacted by other parts of the country saying, hey, we're dealing with a load. Our information say it came up through Tucson or it came up through Phoenix or it came across on Toon Odom Reservation or things of that nature. We're just the funnel where it comes into the United States. So yes, I do believe that we're greater affected by that. Should any particular narcotics be legalized? Oh, that's a decision for voters and, and politicians, not me. I see the damage on just about every narcotic, but I also see the damage of alcohol. And alcohol is, is legal too, so that's a community decision. Um, we would just ask, and what all the associations I belong to say is we need to be informed about 
you know, what the true effects of narcotics or drugs such as marijuana or methamphetamine or cocaine actually do to our youth and to our members who have a propensity to become addicted to them. Is there anything that could be done that would be effective in cutting the number of crimes related to narcotics? Well, we've been doing a lot of those things because crime here, as well as across the nation, has gone down for the past decade. And a lot of that is through education, it's through crime prevention methods, it's through working with a variety of different social servant, so, excuse me, social service agencies. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a, a tongue twister there. <laughs> that provide assistance to people because you can't arrest away out. You arrest away. You're out of this problem. You have got people who some of them it is really an addiction. They need treatment, not incarceration. Um, you know, sending someone who is a user and have never committed a crime other than using that narcotic but it's the third time you have caught them with it, sending them to lifetime or extensive prison sentences, that's really not gonna treat the problem. We need to be very judicious and look at our, our incarceration practices, our sentencing practices, and determining where the best bang for our buck, so to speak, is on how to deal with these problems and also go more into treatment and education to help try and eliminate the problem. Because we've been arresting them for couple decades here and that problem has not gone away. We need to be more intelligent in how we address that. Any further thoughts on incarceration policies? I think they need to be over overhauled completely. Um, the President's Task Force, one of our first recommendations was, this was great, we agree policing needs to be looked at. It's been, it was like 60, 70 years since the previous um, criminal justice task force was put together, but our first recommendation is that there needs to be an overhaul of the entire criminal justice system. Not just police, but courts, judges, prosecutors, public defenders, incarceration. All of these are part of the system and every part of the system needs to be evaluated and adjusted to make sure that we're being effective. By just saying, let's change the police and everything else is going to work, that's, that's naive. And so our recommendation was that the entire criminal justice system be reformed. Am I hearing you say that we have a lot of people in jail, in prison, for drug-related uh, issues that shouldn't be there? I don't know if that they shouldn't be there because they were put there in accordance with the laws as they exist right now. What I'm saying is, are our laws realistic? Are sentencing provisions being effective? Are we trying to get out of them the sentencing provisions what we want to make our society better. I think an argument could be made that no we're not. I think that um, it gets very expensive to keep some of these people in jail for the amount of time we're putting in there and when they come out what happens? We're just putting people with no skills, um, no training, and very few options to succeed back out in the street and it's quite often that they'll go back into criminal misconduct. We'll arrest them again and we'll put them back in, but are we really fixing the problem? I think we need to put some minds towards how do we fix that problem? Uh, I know that uh, some prisoners are going to be <clears throat> some prisoners are going to be sent uh, to Santa Cruz County, right? Yeah. That's going to be a way that we're trying to save money um, and also to relieve the stress on the Peabody County Jail. If we can do some of the, it's a very complex situation, we get charged a certain amount on the first day that we book them, we get charged a different amount, a lesser amount on subsequent days. Well if we can handle some of those subsequent days which are often just the sentencing for a DUI or something like that at a less expensive facility and a facility that has a lot of room as opposed to Pima County which is getting overstressed, that helps us all save money as a region. So we're okay. looking into that. As you prepare to leave, any regrets? Regrets? There's always regrets because you always look back over your career <laughs> if, you're, if you're honest and you say, wow, I wish I would have done that better or I wish I would have thought of this and stuff. So there's missed opportunities, I think, in, in every um, profession and every person's career, but
but regrets for what I did, not a one. I love my job. I love working for this community. Uh, I'm a fifth generation Tucsonan. My family, you know, on my mom's side, there were ranchers. My dad's side, my grandfather came across and was a boot maker. My dad was a shoe repairman. I love Tucson. I've been a part of Tucson. I was raised and educated in TUSD schools. Um, I've worked my entire adult life here. I have no regrets for that. I couldn't conceive my life doing anything different than what I've done. And I'm so proud of this agency and the people who work here. And I'm so appreciative to be able to provide service to my community. So I don't have a single regret in that regard. Very good. I guess only other question I would have is uh, anything you want to say that I haven't asked? Um, yes. I, I would like to, to ask people to, as they hear about issues throughout our country, and if any of them occur here in town, to be patient and let all the facts come out. It seems like we've become a society that wants instant information and often instant information is not complete information. If there's one thing this job has taught me, the initial story is usually never right. Once we start looking into a situation, we find out that there are other elements that didn't get put out at first that change the whole perspective of that story. So I'd ask for people to be patient when they hear about things, let us look into things, let us investigate things and get the full story before decisions are made. It goes against the grain of the way we are as humans, but it really is the more intelligent, mature way to deal with things. Very good. Need to get any shots? Yeah. Let me get